How and why did plants evolve to convert sunlight into food? The directions for a human being are written in code, three billion letters long. These instructions tell our bodies how to live, how to grow, how to die. Researchers call this code the sequence. You know, people who study evolution have it all backwards, tracing the line of biology back through the layers of time toward life's beginning, or beginnings. A number of scientific specialties from molecular biology to geology have been involved in this retrograde effort. But for years, its stars seemed to be the skeleton hunters, the anthropologists and paleontologists who gave us Lucy and Tyrannosaurus rex. Today, evolutionary biologists and geochemists are pushing the frontiers of knowledge even further back. One trail reaches all the way to the origins of something essential to evolution itself, the color green and the process called photosynthesis. About photosynthesis, literally, it means making something with light. This is the process by which all plants and some bacteria use the sun's rays to make food. In the case of plants, a green pigment in the plant's leaves called chlorophyll captures solar energy and uses it to split water, H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen. The hydrogen combines with carbon dioxide absorbed from the air to make carbohydrates which are stored and used to drive the plant's life processes. The oxygen escapes into the air so we can inhale it and exhale carbon dioxide to keep the cycle going. Chlorophyll green is at the heart of photosynthesis and its life-sustaining process. There are other pigments besides chlorophyll, of course, and other colors. Seen from space, the Earth is blue, the color of water in the atmosphere. But here on Earth, green is a color of life itself. Without it, life would go away. Now, life did not start out green or begin with plants or use oxygen or even conduct photosynthesis. Life began, or so most experts believe, in a water-covered world without oxygen. Some 3.8 to 3.9 billion years ago, the oceans would have been broadly anoxic as well as the atmosphere. That means there's no oxygen around. Lacking an atmospheric oxygen, we would have also lacked atmospheric ozone. So we would not have had the sort of global sunscreen that we all require to filter out harmful ultraviolet radiation. The atmosphere probably contained carbon dioxide or methane or both. Ironically, a lack of free oxygen may actually have been a precondition for the appearance of life. Oxygen, you see, is biochemistry's catch-22. It is necessary to life, but it is also destructive. It damages cells and contributes to the aging process. It rusts iron and feeds fires. And if the early Earth had large amounts of oxygen, those oxygen radicals and other things that oxygen does would have damaged the early cells and possibly limited or even prevented a lot of the evolution of life. But minus oxygen, things did get started, somehow. We believe that the beginning of life on this planet took place before there were cells, so that molecules evolved without, in the absence of cells. And these molecules included things that look like DNA today or look like other molecules of the cell today. And eventually, these primitive molecules started to carry out biological processes such as carbon fixation or photosynthesis. They encoded the ability to carry out those processes. And then one day, loosely speaking, one of these organisms learned to thrive in oxygen and developed a means of producing it. We don't know how or why, but evidence of the change is, as they say, written in stone. What you get in these things are very fine laminations of different minerals that are iron bearing. This rock uh, was likely deposited directly associated with the photoautotrophs that produced oxygen. Most of this rock is made of iron oxides and so there had to have been an oxygen source. Now that's a theory that I, th I believe most scientists believe. 
While they don't know how it happened, scientists think they know the result. The new oxygen spewing version didn't just have an advantage over the others, it eliminated them, or most of them. There were some survivors whose descendants retained parts of the record in their genes. A genome can be read as a history book of the biology of organisms, and that's why evolutionary biologists are studying genome sequences, because the genome contains within it a record of the entire history of that organism and its genes. Jonathan Eisen and his team read that history while sequencing the genome of a so-called green sulfur bacterium named Colobrium tepidum, which lives below the surface of hot springs. Chlorobium is one of the organisms that doesn't like to live in the presence of oxygen. It's damaged by oxygen, and so it's what's called anaerobic, living without oxygen. We think that Chlorobium tepidum may represent one of the first forms of photosynthesis that occurred on this planet, and therefore that's why we're interested in studying this organism. Some believe that life originated underwater, near hydrothermal vents on the ocean floor. What looks like seaweed sections waving in the current actually are microbial fronds, colonies of bacteria thriving in the warmth and low oxygen content of the water. The colobrium tepidum, however, needs space closer to the surface. It needs light, so it has to be found where light gets into the spring and it also needs a lot of sulfur compounds and in particular it needs sulfur compounds that aren't damaged by oxygen so it has to grow in the boundary between where there's light and where there's low levels of oxygen in the course of their work Eisen and his team seem to have uncovered a family connection between the anaerobic or oxygen allergic chlorobium and early aerobic organisms called cyanobacteria and we found that Although chlorobium had a lot of unique features, very distinct from these other organisms, they shared a large number of genes, many more than we expected. And many of these genes were genes involved in photosynthesis. What they may have found is one of the prizes of evolutionary studies, a missing link. There are special types of photosynthesis like in chlorobium that we think will allow us to go back in time and trace the evolution of photosynthesis. So in essence, it is very much like the fossils of humans that serve as a missing link to studying evolution of humans. This is the link to studying the evolution of photosynthesis. Eisen says one of the reasons this kind of finding is important is because it tells us a lot about how organisms work today, which is both true and useful for persuading politicians and the public to support expensive evolutionary research but you can't help feeling that the stronger motivation lies in the unquenchable thirst to know why things are and how they came to be, a curiosity produced by almost four billion years of evolution. The Secrets of the Sequence teaching materials were developed at Virginia Commonwealth University with funding from the National Academy of Sciences and the Pfizer Foundation. The original public television series, Secrets of the Sequence, was produced by Ward Television with funding from Pfizer, the Pfizer Foundation, Oracle, and the Council for Biotechnology Information. Special thanks to member institutions of the series advisory board, consisting of Virginia Commonwealth University, Harvard University, University of Wisconsin, University of Michigan, University of California at San Francisco, and the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology, Cambridge, England.